Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to today's Arctic Research Seminar, which is hosted by the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, or ARCUS. My name is Betsy Turner Bogren, and today's team and support team includes Stacey Stout and Kuba Bajenda. Our seminar, entitled Ecological Insights from the New Arctic Animal Movement Archive, tracking three decades of animal movement across the changing Arctic, will be presented by Dr. Gil Bohr of Ohio State University. A link to an online survey will be available at the end of today's webinar, and we would appreciate your feedback as well as any suggestions you have for future webinars. We have a couple housekeeping items before our presentation begins. Next slide, please. You have two viewing options available today, gallery view and speaker view. Gallery view allows you to see the webcams of other online participants. Speaker view allows you to view only the presenter's webcam and presentations. To switch between those two views, use the button at the upper right-hand corner, which is indicated by the red arrow on the slide. Zoom controls, including chat, can be found by hovering your mouse over the bottom of your Zoom window. Next slide, please. You are invited to chat with other webinar participants at any time. To do that, click the chat icon at the bottom of the screen and select the name of the participant with whom you'd wish to chat. There's also an option to chat with everyone participating in the webinar. Questions will be addressed during the question and answer session following the presentation. If you're joining by Zoom, please type your questions into the chat window at any time during the presentation. I will collect them and read them aloud during the Q&A. If you are joining by phone, please raise your hand by pressing star nine, and then you'll need to unmute yourself by pressing star six to ask your question aloud. I will give you a reminder of these guidelines before we start the Q&A. For any technical problems, please contact either Stacy Stout or Kubajenda via email. Stacy is at stacey at arcus.org and Kuba is at kuba at arcus.org. Before we begin, we would like to thank the National Science Foundation Office of Polar Programs for their financial support to Arcus and this seminar series. Now I'd like to welcome our speaker. Dr. Gilbor is a professor in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geodetic Engineering at The Ohio State University, where he studies greenhouse gas fluxes from forests and wetlands. And he has run several long-term flux tower sites. He combines high-resolution models, including large eddy simulations and tree fluid dynamics, with multi-scale observations that link ecological state and function with atmospheric dynamics and hydrology. He is a principal investigator of one of the 12 Ameriflux National Core Flux Sites and participated in writing the National State of the Carbon Cycle Report. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Gil Gore. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. I've, I've scrolled the name. There's some familiar names there to my friends, friends. Hello, hello, everyone else. Hello to, I'm happy to be here and present to you. I will show you the results the, from the new Arctic Animal Movement Archive that we have recently finished compiling and the insight that we gain from having such an archive, which includes three decades of very large scale animal movement data across the changing Arctic. So kind of before we dive into the archive, a little bit of background, the, the, arc, the animal movement archive is composed of animal movement observation. Animal movement observations are defined as any observation of an individual animal identified to the same individual in multiple locations. The very rudimentary form of that can be done by bird bending, for example. So if you bend the bird, you know where you caught it. Later on, the bird is caught again by another, another birder that does bending somewhere else in the world. And at least you now you have a second location. Every repeated observation of the same bird that can be identified to the bend pattern will give you another observation. This is an extraordinarily sparse database. There are more advanced technologies that allow us to have very dense movement database. The Linux technology is a GPS tag. Basically, we put something like our cell phone strapped to an animal, depends what animal it is. It can be strapped to a collar, to an ear tag, to a leg tag, to a backpack. And that GPS, that GPS sensor is set to record location at 
at a given frequency. For some studies, it can be every minute. For other studies, it can be once a day or every few days. And there's, you need to strike a balance between the battery size and the size of the animal and the length of the period where you want to track the animals and how many observations you want to make. Sensors vary by how they communicate the data. Very small sensors don't communicate the data at all. You need to recapture the animal and download the data from the sensors. Other sensors communicate the data through cell phone networks or satellite networks or by handheld radio that if you come anywhere near the sensor. There are other sensors like geolocators that record the, the time of the sunrise and sunset that you can interpret to a location and few other techniques to record location. No matter how you recorded your animal location and no matter what animal that was, you are warmly invited to utilize MoveBank to manage and store this data. MoveBank is an international animal MoveBank database. It is run by the Max Planck Institute. In the picture above, you see Martin Vikelski, the head of the Max Planck Institute for, it used to be animal movement. I think now it's animal behavior and diversity. And Roland Keys, which is the American PI of MoveBank development. And they've set up this move bank such as utilization of the database is free and open to everyone. Whoever has data can register as a user, upload the data to, to the database. However, doing that does not make the data public to the world. When the data is yours, and though it is on move bank, whoever uploaded the data maintain the ownership of the data. However, you can assign co-ownership to other people, you can assign other roles to other people, you can let other people see the data, you can let other people download the data, or you can publish the data to the world if you so choose. There are many functionalities in MoveBank that help you process the data, starting from kind of putting it on a uniform metadata, uh, helping you register the deployment. So for example, telling a park when the tag was collecting location, when it was still in your Jeep, driving to the location where you captured the animal versus when it was actually installed all the animal and moving with the animal. Um, it helps you link which the data of the animal, of the individual that you captured with the data streaming of the tag. It has utility for live streaming for most. Most tag providers have a live streaming agreement with MoveBank so that if you choose that option and set it up in your tag definitions, the data can stream to MoveBank and be processed automatically live on MoveBank, which will save users a lot of work. User love that, loves that. There are several options to clean the data and to control for several errors. David Douglas, which I saw in the audience, developed one of the most useful and popular filters that is working on velocity increments and also cleaning Argos, Argos satellite geolocator data and many other functionalities which make MoveBank a very attractive place to manage your animal movement data. It is not the only place. There are other animal movement archives and databases and many people and agencies prefer their own, their own homegrown databases. So once you put movement data in an archive, what do you do with movement data? And again, back to David Douglas who helped produce this amazing video. Here you see Brisetide curlews migrating from the Polynesian island back to Alaska, where they were originally tagged. And you see that they change the, the path at which they fly to avoid strong headwind. And they've, they, they deviate by hundreds and in some case thousands of kilometers from the straight line just to get preferable wind direction. And it's quite obvious that there are very much aware of kind of the large scale wind pattern over the Pacific Ocean, which is amazing and hard to believe for such a small bird that it will have such advanced large scale knowledge, but somehow they do. And putting, recording the animal movement and then linking it with the environment at which it takes place, it helps analyzing the, the movement data into new 
resources, new avenues of, of knowledge. So classically animal presence absence was used with environmental data to come up with the definition of a home range. What does the animal like to have where it is? The, the new advanced features by linking it to a dynamic environmental data, you can really ask about movement now and not only about presence. So how does the animal move? What, does it, what kind of wind conditions it need to move? What kind of environmental condition is it conscious of and it's responding to? directly or indirectly. So linking movement data with environmental data, both stationary and dynamics, is helping to come up with new knowledge about the ecosystem state and the behavior of animals everywhere in the world. This talk will be specific to the Arctic. So how do we link it with environmental data? There is a huge archive of many, many environmental variables that is observed by many, many satellites of the American, Canadian, European, Japanese, many other international space agencies. On top of that, there are many reanalysis models which are processing global weather data. Again, working on different variables and there are local weather stations and there are many resources of environmental data. What we have developed is the environmental data automated track annotation system where we access to what we think is among the most popular of the environmental variables for interpretation of animal movement. And we let the system to automatically request the data provider for the data set. We identify which scenes, which time period of images or data sets are related to your data request bring it to the MoveBank cloud, and then interpolate those data to the locations of the animal movement, or let you interpolate those data to a rusted mesh that provide context for your animal movement. So here you see both. These are albatross moving from the Galapagos Island to the Southern Peru where they feed. And on the left, we colored the, the movement tracks by the by the flights, by the ocean productivity. So this is interpolated to the track location. You see that usually they, they fly all the way to the southern coast where ocean productivity is the highest. And on the right, you see a, a rastered data set where we again colored it by ocean productivity and overlaid the tracks upon it. With that, you can study not only what happened during the recorded animal movement, but you can ask the alternative hypothesis, what happened where the animal didn't go to, and basically study why did the chicken cross the road or why did it not cross the road. This is a very boring list of the data sets that are linked through ENV data. It's not even all of them, just the one that fit in my one slide. Worth mention, most of the MODIS data archives, so MODIS fire, MODIS ice, MODIS vegetation, uh, we have MODIS ocean, and then the, the GPM and TRMM precipitation satellites, and then several reanalysis data sets, which I have in the next slide. Reanalysis data sets are kind of model generated data, but they are forced by as many observations as they could generate. So they, they run the model. Every day they look at the new data that arrived, tweak the model a little bit, and tweak the model result a little bit to fit what was observed last day, wind it back a whole month and run again. So every day they progress by one day, winding it back a whole month, incorporating the existing data. The reanalysis database that we link to are the ocean, are the Oscar Ocean Current Database. NCEPNAR and ECMWF, the new one, the ERA-5, and we are working on linking NASA DAME. So few cool things as a non-Arctic examples of what you can do with that. Here's a study of Griffin, Himalayan Griffin vultures migrating from Bhutan, which is the kind of lower on the Southern side of the Himalaya mountains to the Tibetan plateau, which is much higher. The vultures fly all the way from Bangladesh, which is at sea level, to above eight or nine kilometers of elevation and experience 
a change of air density by about a factor of, of 50%. So air density at eight kilometers is much less than the air density at sea level. And that means if you were, those vultures are gliding, they never flap. Even when they go over the Himalaya, they do not flap. They use thermal uplift to gain all the elevation. But as you go higher and higher, because the air is thinner, gliding becomes harder and they need to adjust. And we were wondering about how they do that. So we linked data about the mean wind speed and the air density with elevation and the topography with a very high resolution detail, kind of 10 Hertz detail GPS records of flight, which include also accelerometer. So we can tell very accurately how they turn. And from that, we can interpret, we can look at the turn radius as they go further up, how the turn radius vary with air density. And again, air density vary with elevation. And we found that the vultures are aerodynamic geniuses. The red curve are the, is the theoretical curve of how you should speed up to compensate for a given degree of lift, how much should you speed up to compensate for the loss of air density? And the vultures do exactly that. Now, the amazing part is this is not trivial for them to speed up because they go in circles. So speeding up means tilt changing the degree at which they tilt, which will cause them to lose lift. And they, they cannot just glide faster forward because they'll go out of the thermal. So they need to stay within the radius of the thermal and within that speed up as well, so turn faster. But they're very good at it. They've been doing it for a long time. So now to our Arctic business. So the, the Animal Arctic Movement Archive was created as part of the Animal of the Move Above project. You all know the Above program. It's the Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment funded by NASA. This was a very large project. Here are the project participants, PIs, postdocs, and grad students. All of them worked very hard on the project. The project was led and initiated by Natalie Bollman at Columbia University. And we're basically working on trying to collect animal movement records from throughout the Arctic and analyze them and understand how moving animals respond to climate changes in the Arctic. So, the, the first paper that came out of that project was termed the Space Robins paper, although the word Space Robins are not in the title of the official title of the paper. And it analyzed the long term trends in the spring phenology of robins. These are robins that are caught in Slave Lake, Alberta, and they are there they are tagged. And after that tag, they can be followed until they reach the summering ground further north in Alaska. And they've recorded, they've been doing this for a very long time, more than 20 years, 27 years now. And they've, they are seeing quite a shift in the phenology. So Robins arrived to Slave Lake a few days earlier every decade. So with this capability of using move bank with the ENV data tool to kind of have gain easy access to environmental data sets, they study what, what are the predictors of that shift? What environmental variables are best predicting which day the robins will arrive in Slave Lake? So this is as an odds ratio kind of relative to the long-term average. And for example, young robins arrive earlier Deep snow will make them arrive later. Precipitation will make them arrive much later. And then when you look at the, at the migration rate, so how fast they fly from Slave Lake to the summering ground. So the distance to the summering ground is the main driver. The farther they are, the slower they fly, actually. I think they are preserving energy. But then with this deep snow, they will they try to go faster if they go. That's for the entire domain. If you just go east of 130, so the ignoring the very, very far sides, the deep snow slow them out down. And wind, wind speed slows them down. Deep snow, no, deep slow speeds them up. Yes. 
wind speed, high wind slows them up. Warm air let them migrate faster and so on. And understanding that kind of help us predict how they will behave in a decade or two. If we had a prediction of what will be the temperature and wind and snow and the interactions between them in that area of Alaska and, and Yukon, we can understand better when to predict robins to arrive where. And again, the timing of where they arrive has to match up with the timing of the phenology of the insects that they eat and the greening up of where they migrate to. So they have, it's very important. So after the, the robin study was done on a one particular population, a single species, a single study location. So this is the way animal movement studies usually done. There is a group, typically one PI or a group of PIs working in a one location of few related locations, targeting, a, tagging a target species. And it's very hard to create a very long-term data set. So because of the Slave Lake Bird Observatory and their incredible work, we are lucky to have 25 years of this robin population. But in most cases, these studies are basically prey to funding cycles and tend to be three years, maximum five years in length. So we don't have very long-term studies of animal movement. We don't have very large-scale studies of animal movement because single PI groups target specific populations. And we hardly ever have mo uh, animal movement projects that target multiple species, especially if ever, so it will be multiple similar species. So let's say seabirds, but never species of very different glades or different places in the predation hierarchy. So, we envision that our role in that project is not only to analyze specific population and specific species, but to create a research platform which will allow research into long-term changes, large-scale changes, multi-species food web changes that's happening throughout the Arctic through a collaborative effort of putting everybody's movement data together in the same place. And that is the Arctic Animal Movement Archive you see here the defined border of what we call Arctic. So everyone that had movement data in movement that included at least a few points within that border of the Arctic, even if they moved outside of it parts of the year, was invited to participate. And in addition, we reached out to many other researchers that didn't have data in movement and invited them to join the archive. Here's the amazing result, the dynamic result of the archive that Peter Griffith from NASA and the NASA Hyperworld team produced. So what you see here is the fluctuation of the snow, terrestrial snow and ice, sea ice, and NDVI. So NDVI is the green brown, terrestrial snow is white and sea ice is this purplish blue. And on top of that, we have the, the dots are animal locations, the dots are plotted monthly with all the 30 years collapse into a single seasonal cycle. And this is everything in the archive and you can focus on different area like marine mammals in the Baffin Bay. These are caribou movements in Yukon and Northwest Territory. You have seabirds in, in around Alaska. And again, they pop up suddenly because in the, in the, in the winter they move south out of the frame. You can see them here all over the Pacific during the winter. So other things about the archive. So we have the earliest data that we have is from 1991. There's many data sets in the archive which are in live feed. So this image was produced late 2019 when we submitted the paper draft, but the data keeps accumulating and it's all the way to now. Uh, roughly there's about 2 million points of data, 2 million recorded animal locations of about 8,000 individuals, 90 species, and 220 studies. Studies an entity is an administrative entity, it's basically a single group grouping of data created by the PIs that contribute the data. 
typically the studies are the barrier to collaboration. So data, without an archive, data is stuck within the study that it came from. So there are studies of few species, but really putting large data sets together, we need collaboration across studies. As I said, the database is constantly updating as you see as expected the newer data, there's much more of it. And there's all the numbers that I gave you were updated for about half a year ago. There's data is streaming to the archive quite fast and we're very happy about it. So why joining the archive? If you have animal Arctic animal movement data and you're not participating in the Arctic animal movement archive, here's why you should consider it. So first is a, it's helping you standardize the metadata and standardize the quality control. So whenever, if someone is to use multiple data set, they know they went through the same processing that are recorded on the same timestamp with the same time, time stamp standard. So there's no time zone errors issues and all kinds of other common issues that have been cleaned and processed in the same way using the same filters. There's a common access point. You don't need to ask around ear to mouth, who knows someone that may have data. The data in the archive is all listed on movement through the archive portal, which is, this is the screenshot of. So you can find every data set that's willing to collaborate to an Arctic animal movement analysis. You can find it there in the archive. And if it's your data, other people can discover it much more easily simply by finding it in the archive. It provides very easy access point through either through a GUI, which is manual or through an API, which is a, we have in R. So you can have R code kind of moving through the archive and downloading all the data sets in the archive. But these are only the data sets for which you are allowed entry. So everything is password protected. Public access is not guaranteed. The, the, all we require when you affiliate with the archive is that you list a point of contact and you list, you list the metadata, which species, which time periods, how many individuals, and you list a point of contact and a procedure. How would anyone gain access to the data. And if they clear, whoever clears access with the point of contact, point of contact can add them as a viewer to the data sets. And then only then it will be open through the API or through the GUI to those movement users that are registered at the minimum as viewers that can see and download the data. Again, about 60% of the data in the archive is public. So it's open to everyone and you don't need to ask anyone. But again, when you click the different data sets in the archive, it will tell you which data is public or which data you need to ask permission to see the data itself. So it's offering easy access, but while maintaining data safety. And I think it's the easiest tool for data sharing. If you need to share data within your organization, among collaborators or with a broader public or in a large collaboration, that platform gives you all the tools to control who you share the data with, give everyone common access tool and common metadata. So sharing is made much, much easier. And the last thing is data persistence. This is very important. If you are not in some archive like Movement, and if you don't share with the Arctic archive, people will not know that you had this data 20, 30, 50 years from now, you will retire, your computer would have broken down 10 times and replaced, and data tends to be lost. I think we have lost massive amounts of movement data because data was just kept locally on people's computers with the metadata recorded on their field notes, which are lost very quickly. So this is a massive collaboration. This is just the list of authors of the science paper that reported the archive, we allowed each study to have one co-author. So this is about a third of all the people that actually contributed data. And then more people have added more studies after we published the paper that are not even here. Again, it's a fantastic tool for collaboration. Here are some, so what did we learn from the archive? So we, we've made, the, the archive is there for anyone to use. Our hope is that the use of the archive will become very common and anyone that has a question of 
how do something respond to something in the Arctic, we'll first look in the archive if there is enough data to support answering that question. We made kind of went through the low hanging fruit of very cool studies that we can do to show to, to show the utilization of the archive, to show the cool things you can do with the archive. So the first, we have a very large scale analysis. We have caribou movement data from Northwest Territory, Yukon, Alaska, and British Columbia and Alberta. It's data from many, many different years and many, many different studies that collaborated to create this data set. And the data was processed to find the parturition date. This is the date where the caribou is giving birth to her calves. I think they're birthing two calves per year. And the color is the parturition date. The blue greenish is earlier in the year. The red orange is the later in the year. And what we see is hints of adaptation. We see that northern populations are shifting. So it's commonly accepted that the parturition date is very strongly genetically controlled within caribou. So they don't just look at the weather and decide where to have their baby. They will have it nearly the same date every year throughout their lifetime. And we have seen only in northern population, not in southern populations, we see shift of that parturition date by about 10 days per decade. So again, 10, if we consider a generation time of about five years, so it's, it's about five days per generation, this is a very rapid shift, which is assumed to be selective. Here's a different study. We wanted a very long-term analysis, so there, we, we have a 30 year data set of Golden Eagle movement from Alaska and I think mostly from Alaska back south and 30 year studies, nothing that a single scientist can do. 30 years, more or less the scientific lifetime of, of all of us. So if you were lucky and got funded as a first year professor and managed to keep it until your retirement, it will barely be a 30 year study. So the only way to get a true long-term study is to collaborate and put different studies together. And again, we looked at the environmental drivers of this changing of phenology. We observed the day at which they start migrating north and see what is affecting it. And we found the strongest. So they differ by sex and they differ, differ by age. So juveniles migrate earlier than so. Yeah, adults migrate earlier compared to juveniles, sub-adults still earlier compared to juveniles, but late compared to adults. And the environmental control, which we found is the strongest is the winter PDO. So even though it looks like kind of a regular linear trend, there are different slopes for that trend depending on the length of the data set. And we found that the one thing that put it all together in a predictable way is the winter stage in the PDO, a warm Pacific decadal oscillation, a warm phase of the Pacific decadal oscillation will make them migrate earlier, typically. Third study, we, with an archive, we can do studies of multiple species. Very few people track bears and caribou together, but we can combine different studies of predators with studies of angulates to kind of create a predator and prey database. Here we looked at how much, how they change their movement patterns based on weather drivers, and it boiled down to temperature and rain. Basically, if it's hot, do they tend to move more? So here we looked at the repetitive movement within a day. So this is not the long-term migration movement. This is within the summer and ground. It's kind of the hour to hour foraging movements that they do. Are they more fidgety when it's hot? Are they more fidgety when it rains? So in the summer, they don't actually, neither of them care if it rains or not. So you can see at the bottom of this figure, all, all of the lines straddle the zero, which means none of them is significant. And again, the animals don't care whether it rains or not. In the winter, we didn't look at rain, we do the look at snow water equivalent. 
So deep snow is hurting moose and, and wolves. Other caribou don't care about snow in the winter. Moose and wolf do care about snow in the winter and tend to move less. Now, if you look at the summer, we see a very opposing response to temperature. So some species and specifically the moose and caribou tend to move more when it's hot, whereas wolf and bear tend to move less when it's hot. And it's either because they don't like it hot, so they don't want to move much. But what we really think is happening is when it's hot, it's easier for them to find prey. So they, need, they don't need to move as much. So kind of warming gives an unfair advantage to the predator if we interpret that plot correctly. Time. Okay, other cool thing that we can do from animal movement is we can, there are now more and more tag-based measurements. So this is not by linking the location and time information of the movement observation to an external environmental data set. We can learn a lot about the environment from the information recorded on the tag itself. Many tags have temperature sensors, many tags for birds have air, some tags, some advanced tags have wind speed sensors, many tags have pressure sensors, marine tags often have salinity sensors and water pressure sensors that you can interpret for depth. Here you see a very cool analysis. We develop an analysis approach that if you have a high frequency accelerometer tag, you can interpret that to get the wind speed. So you can get a wind speed observation from the data recorded on a tag, which combines GPS, high frequency GPS location and acceleration. And this is a flock of storks where many storks in the same flock were tagged together and we can see them following more or less the same thermal together. So, Another advantage of things we can do with an archive is collect many different observations from the tag. So here we collected temperature observations from ungulates, moose and caribou. We actually have temperature observations from bear and wolf also, but we discovered that the predators tend to heat up much more. So the pattern is very different with the predators than with the ungulates. But with all the ungulates, we find very similar patterns. So the temperature measurements at the angulates tend to be very tightly and, and very accurately. So with a slope close to one correlated with the temperature estimate of the ECMWF reanalysis. Now, which is the truth is a very sophisticated question. ECMWF is at the resolution of 40 kilometers. So it's not a very high resolution data set. There's, there's very high temperature variability, which coming with elevation or simply your location within that assumed model 40 by 40 kilometer pixel. More than that, the model is not perfectly accurate. So the model can have some error. The tag itself has, has its own issues. So the tag is on an animal, it's affected by the, when the animal runs a lot and heats up, it may create some heating on the tag, very much dependent how the tag is installed, but most of these tags are from a collar, so they're quite close to the chest of the animal and on, on the neck. Different animals are, di are different heights, and as you go very close to the ground, temperature increase very rapidly. They can stand in the shade and kind of bias the temperature, so there's been a lot of griping against using collar measured temperatures as a legitimate source of information about the temperature in ecological research. And there's been similar griping against using coarse reanalysis temperature from models, but the fact that they both so tightly correlate together show that they show both each of them and both of them together capture a very large component of reality. Is there some error in each of them? Yes, of course, these are, the R square is not 100, but in many cases, the R square is very, very high and the slope is very close to one, showing you that both temperature measured on colors and temperatures from reanalysis models are probably very realistic. And I will 
finish with the future. I'm super happy to announce we just got funded by NASA for our next big venture. So it's not official yet. I'm still going through the paperwork, but we're creating a similar archive to the Arctic Animal Archive to the Y2Y migration corridor. The Yukon to Yellowstone migration corridor is kind of one of the largest international conservation corporations is, is cooperating between Canada and the US with many here, the red on the left panel are all the conserved area, which are either national parks, state parks, national forests, tribal lands, uh, local conservation easement, the many different type of conserved land within the white to white corridor. And here in, in um, no, I'm very sorry, opposite. These are the purple on the right hand figure are conserved lands. The red on the left hand figure is all the animal movement that we already have from the Arctic archive that have entered at least partially the y to y migration corridor region. And we will outreach many other users and many other researchers that have animal movement data from the y to y and develop a new generation of tools similar to ENV data, but that are built on ENV data. So the next stage is not only to bring the environmental data into the analysis, but to actually give a very easy GUI guided selection of analysis tools. So how would you go about and use those, whatever environmental layer you prescribe to define the home range of an animal? or define what controls connectivity throughout the corridor, which environmental variables. So we are planning to make research tools that will ease collaboration to, to answer those questions of home range conservation and migration connectivity. And I will end it here. And I thank all the literally hundreds of people that provided, the, probably more in the thousands of people that provided data that I've shown many, many different research collaborators that provided the fantastic images that I've seen. They've all agreed that we show it as part of the project, but still credit is due. And the fantastic team of MoveBank and my own research team, and most particularly Sarah Davidson, which makes everything happen. And if any of you have animal movement data, you should make a point to get to know Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bora. That was a great presentation. Uh, we're now ready to begin our question and answer session. And as a reminder, if you're joining by Zoom, please type your questions in the chat window at any time and I'll capture them um, and read them aloud. If you're joining by phone, you may um, ask a question by raising your hand by pressing star nine on your phone. Then you'll need to unmute yourself by pressing star six and ask your question aloud. Um, and if needed during, um, as we, Go forward. Dr. Bohr has offered to continue to be available for another five or ten minutes at the top of the hour after we do an initial close of the um, of the seminar. Uh, so our first question today uh, comes from uh, Dr. or from William Manley, and he asks, uh, "Could you share the link uh, to the mapping portal you showed that displayed the data over 3D satellite image map of the Arctic?" There is no such which the the animation or just the uh, okay. more of a 3d image um of the arctic uh, i don't think it was an animation no okay thank you this <clears throat> i see the mapping tools within move bank which are great right so some more so, sophisticated mapping tools so few things the the link if you go to movebank.org hit enter you'll find MoveBank. In MoveBank, you can search for the Arctic Animal Movement Archive, and you will find this web page, which is the archive. In If you scroll down on this page that I have screen captured here from movebank.org, you will find a copy of that map. And there is most of the images that I show are the figures in a, in a science paper that we published recently. You will find it there. The mapping tool of MoveBank which I think you mean that thing, that's again, movebank.org. And if you will upload your animal movement data to movebank.org and go into data editing mode, you will see your data like that. 
The cool thing about the tool is that you have a dual table. So you can see your data as a data table and the map and you can click the map and it will take you to the line in the data or click the data line it will pop up a marker on the map. So you can work on your data and, and quality control it very easily. However, that is not a very sophisticated mapping tool. The cool animations, things like that, there is no set tool in MoveBank. In fact, this image was produced by David Douglas and his team, which I think is in the audience. You can ask them what magic they use to make this amazing figure. I think it's part of the Google Earth Engine KML graphing tool. However, all the information, the, all the data that you need to generate this, you can get from MoveBank Env data. So in this case, the wind comes from MoveBank Env data. The background image is MODIS and the animal movement is from the track data itself. Thank you. Um, we had a next question that was uh, from Amanda Zolke and I, I don't know if you want to expand on this. She was asking, is, in vain, is the main environmental factor affecting change in caribou parturition timing, the snow cover or the depth or another factor? We do not know that. So this research is still ongoing. ongoing. It's led by Eli, Eliezer Gurari is in Maryland. And we don't have super accurate information of the snow depth. So I don't know that we can answer it accurately. What we have found directly is just the effect is the differences between populations. So it's just the location and the elevation. Where, where is it here? So it's the location and the elevation that came up important, but we didn't extensively check other environmental variables in that question of the caribou parturition. Typically the same population. So if you look for, okay, if you check the population that did not change, the Southern Barren Ground caribou, the green. So there's very little variation within the population so they tend to always do it at the same date, regardless of the condition, which is why we were surprised to find that there's a long-term shift of that because they are responding to something that's slowly changing. Again, because it's assumed to be a genetic control, so they shouldn't vary it almost at all from year to year. Thank you. And Julia Boyka asks, uh, why does Mochena caribou temperature data deviate stronger from the ACMWF temperature? I have and no clue. None <laughs> of us. So this is a preliminary figure. We, we, please, people understand this is a preliminary. It was the last figure almost in the slide because this is not in the science paper. This is a paper we are just starting to work on. So this is the cool things we could do. Why is the Molchatna caribou different? We don't know. Maybe there's less, maybe there's less trees to hide under. Maybe they, there's just a few trees and they tend to go there when it's warm. It could be the type of sensor. It, so these are different studies. Each of them use a different tag. It could be that this tag specifically is behaving differently or the way that it was, the collar was constructed makes the sensor closer to the skin. We really don't know. We will look at particular, as this study moves on, we want to bring in more population, kind of see if there's some patterns comes up of when is it matching and when it's not, and start to understand the differences between population. Thank you. We should have a follow-up question. Um, no, Christine uh, Tycho asks, can you say more about what types of models you are using, a focus on statistical models, or have you also applied machine learning techniques? It depends for what. So what you see here is a super trivial linear regression, which is a, the simplest of simple statistical models. We, for home range analysis, there is, a, for home range analysis, we're going more and more towards smarter machine learning kind of to identify the pattern and combination of environmental conditions that define where the animal wants to be. I have done some machine learning analysis to identify movement patterns, for example, of zebras in the Kalahari, but we, 
we use a whole range of models. It really depends on the question and the type of data. I think she has a follow-up question. As you mentioned, some prediction, for example, migration of caribou over the next decade. Um, are you looking at other prediction problems? So one thing I want to emphasize, I don't look at any of these problems. I do the infrastructure that allow the ecologists that analyze these problems to collaborate, to access movement data, and to link it to environmental data. So I'm just reporting what the wonderful people that I collaborate with have found. I've done some movement analysis in my life, none for, for Arctic animals. So I can't really answer that question. The data is there, the tools are there. We, will, we are now focusing on statistical tools for home range analysis and characterization of connectivity. We are working with, the, with the, John Feeberg, he's a statistician in Minneapolis. He will decide what he thinks are the best kind of methods which are broad enough to be of general use. None of what we do is limited to a particular model. We are, server, we are serving the data. And, and I'll be super happy if you will follow up. If you are interested in a particular question, something that you need to forecast, we can check if the data exists, if the data owners wants to collaborate and which environmental data could best serve the model that you may be interested in. Thank you. Isaiah Myers, or, uh, sorry, Isla Myers Smith um, asked, she says, amazing and really exciting data set. I have followed the papers with great interest. How can we incorporate, uh, incorporate local people and their potential concerns about animal movement data and research on those animals and public data sets such as this? I am particularly thinking about caribou in the Western Canadian Arctic and the ecosystems in which I work on the Yukon coastal plain. Um, and that's, so that's the, that's the question, thank you. I, I think I have a good answer for that. So one set of tools that MoveBank offer is a web API. So basically if you, if someone in your community or some agency that work near your community has animal movement data that they're willing to share. If you process it through MoveBank, then you can create a local website with a direct feed to the database in MoveBank. So you can edit it differently. You can highlight it with different color and it can always show live where are my animals are doing. We've had that working with some bird watchers that are very excited. So there is a, there's an osprey website that they are tagging ospreys and always look where the ospreys is right now at that minute. So this is particularly exciting with tags that, that stream, that do a live stream of data. It is, I think it'll be super exciting as kind of a high school project or a nation or imagine a high school. So the kids may participate in the tagging or the kids do some kind of a work about the animal that will be tagged by the agency. Animals are tagged and then there's the school website that show they can name the individuals and do all kinds of cool stuff. And there's a school website that show where they are right now. So there's some risk to it. Hunters can go and kill the animal because they know where they are right now. So of course should be done with some caution, think which animals you wanna do it for, but with the right balance could be very cool. Similarly, a specific national park or a protected area or a sanctuary, if they tag animals, they can have like a website showing where the animals tagged in their park are currently roaming the world. And I, I worked briefly with Disney, Disney Resort are tagging, a, there's a Disney, Disney Resort in Florida have a huge conservation easement and they do a lot of ecological research and we work to create exactly that on their turtles, so stream the ocean currents Turtle locations in some Disney website, but then it didn't happen because they didn't want it. So it's a good idea. I, th I think yeah. someone should do it. Um, Hannah Wood asks, she says, a great talk, really interesting and great to see so much collaborative effort. Um, and amazing to see what can be done with these long term data sets. Thanks a lot. Now, there's several people who have been very complimentary, or, you know, excited about this talk. Um, yeah, Steve Ferguson you. says, um, we've submitted whale and seal surface telemetry data. Would MoveBank be able to input dive data as well, included um, CTD data 
so that oceanographers could monitor the marine environment? Easy answer, yes. In the real deep weeds of the details, maybe there's a technical issue specifically related to dive data, but MoveBank has quite a lot of marine mammal data. So I think they, I think they solved that. So it's basically thinking about the data structure, how you record data during the dive. So the, the easier thing which I know already exists is that you can attach, so think, it can be handled similarly the way they handle accelerometers. So you have the GPS data that's recorded as a, in the track. So you have the location and time. Accelerometer data is at a different frequency than the GPS. So it has its own time frequency, but it's not associated with the location. So the way they do it is like an, an attached and an addended data file to the movement record. So the data is preserved is not shown on the map or anything, but if you ever want to access the movement data and the accelerometer data, it's all there. I think we dive better things can be done. And I actually, I'm almost sure that they, they did those because that's quite a common question. They have quite a lot of marine data there, but they're also very eager to work with user community and address specific issues like that. So if you try, you'll, you'll find, you'll be happy, try. Talk to Sarah Davidson. You'll find her link in the movement, in the MoveBank website. She can, and I can put you in touch. Thanks. Um, the next question is from Bob Childers. Uh, can earlier data sets be accommodated in Northeast Alaska and Northeast Canada energy issues surrounding the Arctic refuge oil development and Arctic gas proposals led to heavy expenditures? Arctic gas sponsored research seems particularly subject to loss. They'll be amazing. In my mind, one of the biggest roles of the archive is to preserve the data. And part of preserving the data is make sure that the data of now will not be lost as that data. We managed to get data as far as 30 years ago, and even that not a lot. If you have older data sets, if you have access to old data, even if it's like written down in printed Excel files, we can make the effort of getting undergrads to scan them and, and digitize them. We are very excited about very old data sets. Nice. Um, David Douglas asks, uh, Rolf uh, Weinzinger, the lead architect, architect, lead software architect of MoveBank created the Shorebird wind dynamic animation using custom Java code that he authored. That code has never been implemented as a tool in MoveBank. However, there is an R package that attains a similar end product. The R package is called Wind R. Can you, do you want to say something about that? Uh, I think this was in, in response. So previous question asked how that map was produced and I referred them to David. And I think that was David answering it. Hi, David. Okay. And we both love and miss Rolf. Rolf is no longer giving his amazing skills to move bank and is servicing the banking community, which is why is that, that code, which was one of the later things he developed, never got implemented fully. But yeah, there, there are R packages that do similar stuff. And you know, this mapping is not, is not trivial, but the cool maps with animation can be done in R tools or Google Earth tools. Thank you. Tom Anderson asks, he says, uh, excellent talk, and asks, has this data set improved understanding on sea ice influence on animal movement? Could sea ice prediction aid prediction of animal movement? The answer is yes. I personally didn't test it. I think I, most of the people that directly collaborated within this above study were terrestrial ecologists. So, but there is a lot of marine mammal data in the Arctic archive and in movement, there's a lot of marine animal, there's a lot of marine mammal movement data, which is in other database and not in movement. I wish we could all come together and make the Arctic marine archive that have everything. And at that point, I think it'll make super exciting research about the relationship between movement and sea ice patterns and Pacific decadal oscillations or Arctic, the, the PDO and Lino, all kind of long-term oscillation, sea ice and marine mammal movement, I think is an exciting question. Thanks. 
we're right at the top of the hour and we have several other questions, but for those who are leaving now, I want to um, share closing remarks and then we'll get back to the questions. Um, thank you very much for Dr. Bohr, who's agreed to stay on for another five to 10 minutes to address those questions. For those of you who are leaving now, today's webinar will be archived and available within the next few days at arcus.org research seminar series slash archive. You can visit the Arcus homepage for more information about Arcus, our programs and upcoming Arctic related events. Please mark your calendars for our next webinar entitled Effects of Climate Change on Seabirds, which will be presented by Emily Choi from McGill University. And that will be held on Friday the 23rd of April starting at nine o'clock Alaska daylight time. Uh, and we are always looking to improve our seminar series as well as looking for suggestions for future seminar topics and speakers. Please take a minute or two to complete our short survey. A link will be available now in the, in the chat. It's on the screen and we will send this along with um, it, an email once this seminar has been posted. So thank you very much for joining us for those who have to leave now. Um, and uh, we'll get back to the question and answer session for those who are able to stay. Again, thank you, Dr. Bohr for, for, for staying with us. I believe the next question that we wanted to address was from Hannah Wood. And she says, thanks for such an interesting talk. So in theory, could researchers enter their movement data and then use the tools which you provide to extract the concurrent environmental variables, i.e. sea surface temperature for the location data from the tracks in a CSV or similar document? Thanks again. Absolutely, yes. And it's very, very easy. If you didn't do it already, go ahead and do it. Thank you. And, and we have resources to help you. Awesome. Thank you very much. You'll probably hear from me. <laughs> Great. Um, and M. Coffin asks, might there um, be a way to include narrative data from traditional native residents of Alaska and Canada regarding animal movements over time into this database? Of, of technical counting and tracking data? That's a tricky question, very interesting one. I, 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 I can share my on the fly thoughts about it. We did not do it yet. So the, the limit of the archive, so for example, we do not accept eBird type of observation where you just see an animal and from multiple observation, you can infer movement, but the movement is not linked to a single specific identified individual. So move back by decision is only individual movement data. So these are movement tracks of, of animals. So these are not population level movement. If native communities observe individual animals, track them and record their locations in any way that can be translated to a timestamp and a location for a particular individual. Yes, we can. That is the answer. Then is easy, straight up. They can write it down, maybe put it in Excel, and we can upload it to Movement with very little effort. If those narratives are not related with a particular location or particular animals, but are more general of the animal type or the species or the location but they accompany a GPS-based tagging effort of the same community, we can, they can be part of the metadata of the study and basically be stored for posterity attached to the movement data as part of the study metadata. Thank you. Uh, Julie Boyka asks a follow-up question about the uh, Malchina caribou temperature data deviation. Could it also be that the ECMWF data have a complex footprint, including ocean and mountain? Some local weather section data could be checked against uh, the ECMWF data. That is, again, since this is a preliminary data, we did not look into the reason. Everything is possible. It's possible that at that location, ECMWF is much less accurate than other location. Maybe if there is, I, 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 again, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I honestly don't know where the Malchatna car, where Malchatna is. is. If it's in the mountains, I will believe it. ECMWF is not very accurate in the mountains. If it's very close to the shore, again, I will believe it because of this mixed footprint, coastal terrestrial signature. We, we just, I put that slide as a starter 
both that slide and the white to white, the Yukon to Yellowstone slide, are kind of more a call to participation than research conclusions. If you are interested in that, if you have data, or if you have temperature measurements from tags of ungulates in the Arctic, or if you work at the Y to Y with animal movement, I will be excited if you contact me. These are things that we just started working on. We don't have any real conclusions for that. Thank you. Um, and uh, Isla Meyer Smith uh, writes a uh, comment as a follow up to my question. I agree that there are some really cool outreach things that could be done with the Movement Bank platform and data, but I think there are also potentially pretty substantial concerns about making live location data public on hunted species in terms of conservation concerns, but other concerns and those of us who collect these data are trying to keep any community concerns at the forefront of what we do. I think some communities might not be comfortable with these data being made public and those of us who collect data may not be the best arbiters of whether they should be made public or not. Perhaps so, something pondering. So first, I'm absolutely well aware of that. I, I hope you don't misinterpret that what I said is take your data and post it for the community. You ask about community outreach. This should be a work to get, if the community wants to have a website and you are tracking something that is not under concern, then you could, uh, again, having a website showing live location is one cool thing that I think, one thing that I think will be cool to do, I'm aware that it's not always possible and should be done with a lot of caution and absolutely should be led by the community, specifically with MoveBank, because of the web API, you can give the control to the community, they make the website and they can, pull the data live from movement to the website, but then you can fast the locations, you can average the locations, you can only show last year locations. There are lots of other things you can do, but movement will create very easy access to the data for the owner of such website. So if the owner of the website and the owner of the animal tracking data work together to figure out what's the best way to show which data, what are the limitations, I think cool things can be done. It'll be very exciting for the community. Thank you. Um, I think that looks to me like the questions are um, closing down. And there was one question about sharing the link to where the recording site is that will be archived and shared when we send um, information. Once everything is archived, a recording will be available on the ARCIS site, so people can look there. Um, before we close down, Dr. Boer, is there anything that you wanted to um, share before you close? I was thinking maybe you wanted to tell us a little bit more about what was the, the new funding opportunity that you shared on your last slide. So again, that's a, we are, we will soon start to curate the Yukon to Yellowstone migration corridor archives. We expanded the Yukon all the way out to North, North, Northwest Territory. Any animals that are moving kind of along the Rocky Mountains are very interesting for that context. The focus of that archive is to analyze the effectivity of conservation area, disturbance, forests in the movement and especially connectivity along that very important international movement corridor. So if you are working with animal movement in that corridor, or if you are living there, or if you're working with a community that lives there or an NGO that's interested in conservation there, please feel free to contact me. Again, the work didn't start at all, so we can brainstorm as to how you can participate, what you can contribute, what you can get from that. We will make workshops, I think it White Horse Yukon, but COVID has now put a hold to all of that. And that's all I know now. But again, if you are in that area, please contact me. Thank you. Well, I think we're ready to close now. On behalf of Arcus, I want to thank everyone who joined us today. And a special thanks to uh, Dr. Gil Boro for his excellent presentation. Today's webinar will be archived and available within the next few days. Um, and that will be on our website, arcus.org, research-seminar-series-archive. And that's where you'll find a recording of the seminar as well. 
You can also visit the ARCUS homepage for more information about ARCUS, our programs, and upcoming Arctic-related events, including the upcoming webinar in, in April that we mentioned earlier. Uh, we do welcome your feedback. We're always looking to improve the seminar series um, and looking for suggestions for future seminar topics. Please do take a minute or two to complete our short survey. And that is linked um, in this, that Kuba has linked that to everybody in the Survey Monkey on chat. And I uh, think he's relinked it again there. And um, we'll follow up with an email that you will, you will receive a follow-up email, all attendees will. Uh, once the seminar has been posted to our archive. This concludes our seminar. Thank you again to Dr. Bohr and to all of you for joining us today. And I hope the rest of your day is great and that you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. <laughs>